don't know me, my name is Aaron and I am part of the eldership team here. It's so great this morning to be able to worship together. Now, of course, being together this morning is one of the most important ways that we do meet together as Grace Church um, because it's an opportunity to open God's Word together and to worship Him. But also, we meet midweek in home groups. So much of how we do things as a church is through our midweek meetings. Now, for those of you that are new to Grace, our home groups are groups of between roughly 12 and 20 people, which we find is a good size in order to build relationships. Um, and we meet in these groups, uh, currently via Zoom, across the city um, each week. Now, what we do when we meet is we pray together, we worship, we open God's Word, we encourage one another, and we share our burdens. They are such a valuable time together. So it is important that we're praying for our time together as home groups. So before Ben and the team lead us in a time of worship, I'm just going to lead us in a couple of minutes praying for our home groups, praying for our home group leaders, and praying that God would strengthen us and he would use us as Grace Church through these groups. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that when you save us, we are not alone. You save us and you call us into church, into a family, into a body. And I thank you, Father, that you have created home groups for us here in Abu Dhabi, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that, that you have given people a heart, a desire to lead these groups. And I pray, Lord, for our home group leaders. I pray, Lord, that you would increase them in passion for you, Lord, that you would increase our home group leaders' zeal to see you glorified. I pray, Father, that you would help our leaders to have wisdom as they lead their groups and ultimately as they point towards you. I pray, Father, that our home group times would be characterized by a deep love of you. I pray, Father, that, that people would be cared for and shepherded. And Lord, I pray that as your word is opened, glory comes to you through these groups. I pray, Father, that our groups would be united by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that you would be building deep relationships where people come who have needs, who need encouragement, and burdens are shared, Lord. We pray, Father, that our groups as well would not just be inward looking. Of course, it's so important that we care for one another as a body, Lord, but I pray that our home groups would be looking out, seeking to share your gospel. I pray, Father, that you would give us boldness as we share the stories, the testimonies of what you have done for us and what you have done in our lives. And I pray, Father, that our home groups would be full of fruit, that people would be changed through them, Lord, and that we would be seeing the gospel being preached and that people, Lord, through our home groups would be added to your kingdom. We pray also, Lord, that you would be raising up new leaders. I pray, Father, that you would be speaking to people's hearts right now, that they would be called into this great opportunity to serve you and that you would have more home groups across this city because, Lord, we ultimately long to see you glorified. I pray, Lord, that all these things would be for your glory in your precious name. Okay, if I could invite you all to stand now, we're going to have a time of worship, and we're going to start just by listening to Psalm 89, verses 1 to 5. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens, you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. Yes, church, we gather together to sing of the steadfast love of our Lord. And today is the day that we mark the remembrance of communion. The moment that Christ instituted the new covenant, uh, the moment that he gave us this sign to remember him by. And so after we sing a couple songs, we're going to be taking communion together. So the encouragement is to prepare your hearts by setting your mind upon Jesus Christ, the one true Messiah, the king from David's throne, the one whose throne is established forever and ever. Let's worship together.
He became sin who knew no sin that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Christ. The Bible tells us that while we were dead in our sins, God made us alive in Christ. That while we were still sinners, God shows his love for us through the giving of his son. We were lost. We were hopeless. But through Christ, we have hope and we have joy. Hallelujah. Church, hallelujah. Sing with me, hallelujah. 
what we're here to remember is that all we have is Christ. That he did everything for us. He accomplished on the cross by his death our salvation. The Apostle Paul reminds us to remember that you have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God the Son took on flesh and gave his life as a ransom for us and that's what we are remembering. So if you have your communion elements, just lift off the little lid on the top, grab the bread that's in there, the wafer, 
And Jesus tells us that as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. Remember his body broken for you. Let's take together. And then on the night of Jesus' betrayal, he was celebrating the Passover feast with the disciples. And he took the cup that remembers the blood, the blood of the lamb that was put on the doorposts that saved Israel. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. And so as we drink, we do this in remembrance of the blood of Christ shed for us. Let's take together. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we stand in awe of you and the sacrifice you made to redeem us. We confess that all of our hope is found in the price that you paid. We thank you for the grace and the mercy you showed to us at the cross. We pray that you would remind us of that daily, hourly, so our hope would be fixed on you. And that we would sing and we would rejoice together that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So in response to remembering the death of Jesus Christ, let's rejoice together that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb.
Rejoice together and we overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of our testimony. The word of our testimony. Come on, sing it out. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony. Jesus, we praise you that by your blood we are secure, that we have hope, that we have joy eternal, and we rejoice in the salvation that you brought by your death on the cross and your resurrection. Keep our eyes focused on you. Show us your glory, we pray, in your holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. It's so good to worship together, isn't it? What an amazing time. I love that. So good. So for those of you that don't know me, my name's Aaron. Uh, I'm part of the eldership team here at Grace. Uh, and today we are going to be continuing on through our series in the book of Exodus. So before we open our Bible, just a reminder of, of what's come before. So last week we read how God had prepared Moses and Aaron to go into the presence of Pharaoh, to not just request, but actually to demand that Pharaoh let God's people go. And this is what God told him to do. At the start of Exodus, uh, start of, sorry, in Exodus 4, 21 to 23, God said this, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, there are a number of things that make me feel nervous. And I'm pretty sure that going to meet, indeed going to address the, the king or a queen of a nation would be one of them. And then think, how much more nervous would I feel if I was uh, forced to flee that nation, even if it was 40 years before, because I had murdered someone from there? Put yourself in that position just for a moment. Just spend a moment imagining that you were going back, say, to the country that you're from, and you had to stand before the king or the queen or the president or the prime minister, whoever is in charge of the country that you're from, and you had to go back to them in these circumstances. And then imagine that God has said to you, this is what you've got to do. Firstly, you've got to go back to this king or queen, this leader of the country, and you've got to demonstrate his power by performing wonders, but at the same time, knowing, because God has told you, that, fair, that, that he would be hardening 
their heart towards what you're going to say. And then you've got to utter the words on God's behalf that you refuse to let Israel go, so I will kill your firstborn son. That would be terrifying, wouldn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but when I have a difficult conversation that I've got to have, what I do, I'll often kind of reverse it, uh, rehearse it again and again in my mind, and I'll think about how the other person might react to my responses and what I'll say. And, and of course, in these conversations that I have in my head, I'm far more brave, I'm far more direct, and I'm far more articulate than I am when it comes to having the actual conversation, where I'll kind of stumble through my words and, and nothing will come out as I'd planned. But the worst bit is, even when I'm bravely rehearsing my monologue of what I'm going to say, I know the reality that what will come out is not what I'm preparing. So I can only imagine how Moses must have been feeling at this moment. On one hand, he must have been terrified to be going before Pharaoh and planning to utter these words, I will kill your firstborn son. But at the same time, Moses must have also been full of anticipation to see what God would do, to see how God would demonstrate his power in order to free the people of Israel. And here is where we start this morning. We're standing on this precipice of what I think is the most difficult conversation that Moses could have. So if you've got your Bible at hand, can you turn with me to Exodus chapter 5? And we're going to start by reading verses 1 to 9. Afterward, Moses and Aaron, you'd have thought I'd be able to read my own name, wouldn't you? <laughs> Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel not go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. Okay, I think the first thing to notice here is that Moses and Aaron have actually got in front of Pharaoh in order to make their demands known to God. Which actually, when you think about it, given Moses' background, is in itself quite remarkable. And it's not highlighted, it's not played up in the text at all, but I think this in itself just points towards the sovereignty of God in enabling this to happen. Not only this, but we see here a remarkable turnaround in Moses in only the previous chapter, we saw him telling God that he couldn't go to Pharaoh to speak because he was ineloquent, that he was slow of speech and of tongue. Yet here he is alongside Aaron, proclaiming to Pharaoh as a prophet. He says, thus says the Lord, let my people go. And this isn't just a case of Moses getting brave. This is God fulfilling his promise to Moses from Exodus 4, Verse 12, he says this, Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. God has given this authority to Moses. And this is so important for us to see. 
This is not the people of Israel. This is not Moses. This is not Aaron who have gone to make these demands of Pharaoh. This is God. And because this demand is a demand from God, the correct response from Pharaoh would be to obey. But of course, that's not what we see here in the text. Pharaoh is not impressed by Moses speaking to him as a prophet of God. Indeed, Pharaoh's response is to claim no knowledge of this God who Moses speaks of. Because this God that Moses speaks of is not among the many gods that Egypt worshipped. In fact, given that the Israelites were slave to his people, he probably viewed their God as weak. Pharaoh would have seen the God of the Israelites as being subservient to him, and he would have seen himself as being the ultimate God. In his, his, his worldly wisdom, he was not going to give in to the demands of such a weak God. So instead, what we see in his pride, Pharaoh expresses complete disdain for the Lord. And in his pride, he literally scoffs at the idea that he should listen to him. In doing this, what Pharaoh is doing is effectively he is putting himself in the place of God. He's saying, I am in my own sight greater than Yahweh, the Lord. Clearly, Pharaoh hasn't read Proverbs 16, 18, which says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, in fairness to Pharaoh, that hadn't been written at the time. But of course, we know with hindsight that this fall that we would see become of Pharaoh would be of epic proportions. And if you are here this morning, if you are not trusting Jesus, then I would beg of you to take heed to these words. Like Pharaoh, you might be thinking, well, this God has not revealed himself to me, so I can't possibly know him, let alone obey him. We read in Romans 1, verses 18 to 21 this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. God leaves us with no excuse to reject Jesus. If we choose to write his creation off as random mutations out of an infinity of nothing, then we will reap the rewards of that supposed wisdom. But you might say, if you don't know this God, if you don't know Jesus, then, well, okay, creation may point towards God. It may point towards a creator, but that's a big leap then to knowing Jesus. To which I would say, you're asking the right questions. And Jesus himself answers this in Matthew 7, verses 7 to 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. If you earnestly call out to Jesus, he will open the door, and he will reveal himself to you. So if this morning you do not know Jesus, then like Pharaoh, please don't ignorantly and pridefully dismiss him. Rather, look around you, consider the complexity that points towards a creator and cry out to Jesus. And I promise you, he will answer you. Okay, back to the narrative. That's what Pharaoh didn't do. Now, despite his denial, Moses and Aaron, they didn't give up. So these first two verses, he denied God, but Moses and Aaron carried on. They, they were speaking with the authority that had been given to them by God. And they had received, as I've said, this promise of bold speech. So they asked again, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go on a three-day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Now, note that this time, 
they mentioned that they would only be gone for three days. Or in other words, from Pharaoh's perspective, they would go and quickly they would be back to work. He wouldn't be losing out on too much. And we also see them mention the possibility of if they didn't do this, then they'd be incurring God's divine wrath for not worshipping him in the way that they were supposed to. And I don't think it's clear as to the reason they did this, whether they were either trying to appeal to the better side of Pharaoh so that they wouldn't incur the wrath of God, or whether actually they were saying, we might all get killed and you'll be left with no slaves. But either way, their motive is clear. They were trying to convince Pharaoh that it would be better for them to go and worship God, better for him that they go and worship God, than that they don't. But this time we see Pharaoh's response is even stronger. He not only rejected them again, but actually he says the the material they need, namely the straw to make the bricks, they would have to collect themselves. And it seems what he's doing here, he's making an example of the request that they're maybe making. Maybe he's, he's reasoning that if he punishes them, then the people of Israel won't make any more requests of him. And possibly he's, he's trying to stop the Israelite slaves from listening to Moses and Aaron in trying to stir up trouble. So let's turn back to the passage and see how it played out. So we're in uh, Exodus 5, we're at verse 10 now. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday, as in the past? Okay, so here we see Pharaoh's taskmasters following on, following through, sorry, on, on the threat that Pharaoh made. Clearly, Pharaoh was used to getting his own way, which I think explains the pride that we saw in the previous verses when he was faced with God. This is why he went head to head with God, because treat, people treated him like he was, his, he was God. If Pharaoh said jump, the response would be, how high? Now, no doubt they would have seen the unfairness of what he was demanding. It says they had to go all over the land of Egypt to collect stubble. It wasn't like there was a, a straw warehouse that they had to go and pick it up from. This was a completely unreasonable request. But Pharaoh, to the taskmasters, was the highest authority. So they had no choice. They had to obey. And we also see the Israelites tried to fulfill the requirements being made upon them in trying to gather the straw. Because, of course, to fail to do so, to fail to follow Pharaoh's instructions, would have led to grave consequences. But then we read that they failed to meet this in the first two days. And they were only going to get worse. They would be getting more and more tired. They must have been wondering, how is this God's plan? Is this really what God wants for us? Remember, only two, a few days before, sorry, in, in Exodus verse 4, verses 30, chapter 4, 30 to 31, we read this. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. They believed that they were going to be freed. They had expected that Moses and Aaron were going to visit Pharaoh and then the next thing that would happen, would they would be able to go and worship their God. Yet days later, here they are in the worst possible situation. Not only are they still slaves, but now they are slaves that are not able to meet the demands of their master. If ever there was a situation for despair, this must have felt like it for the people of Israel. Okay, let's turn back to the passage. We're going to pick up from Exodus 5, verse 15. Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your slaves, your servants like this? 
No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is in your own people. But he said, you are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, you shall be no, by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Okay, so after trying for two days to meet these impossible demands, the Israelites have had enough. So they go before Pharaoh himself to plead the case. But of course, Pharaoh doesn't care. Again, he accuses them of being idle and, and, and reiterates the demands that he previously made. Now, at this point, we see that for the Israelites, all hope has completely evaporated. Not only were they going to be not allowed freedom from Pharaoh, but now their lives were being made impossible. So anger set in. And they turned their anger not towards the one who was punishing them, Pharaoh, but instead they turned their anger towards Moses and Aaron. And in many ways, this is understandable. A few weeks earlier, they may have been slaves, but their lives were at least bearable. If they kept their heads down, if they cracked on with their work, then they would live at least, if not comfortable lives, they wouldn't be living lives in fear of what was going to happen to them. They must have felt as though Moses and Aaron had just come along and taken a gamble with what little they had in the hope that they'd strike it lucky, and they'd lost. And in the process, the people of Israel must have felt as though they've lost everything. But in thinking like this, in turning on Moses and Aaron, the people of Israel are actually turning on God. Because Moses and Aaron are merely his messengers. This was God's message. This is God's message to Pharaoh that has put them in this position. And the people of Israel can't claim ignorance in this either. Because as we read a few moments ago in, in, in chapter 4, verse 31, they recognized the truth. I'll just read it again. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshipped. They had gone along with this plan. But so quickly, their apparent faith turned into unbelief. Can you relate to this? Maybe you're out of work this morning and you see a job that, that might be perfect for you. So you spend the next few weeks preparing for an interview. And you're like, I know, I'm sure God is going to give me this job. This feels like it's the one for me. And during this time, you're devoted in prayer and you're trusting God and you're feeling, yes, God, is, God has got something good for me. And then the interview comes along and it all starts to unravel and it doesn't go to plan and, and you don't get the job. But because of your focus has been so single-minded up until this point, you've also lost out on a bunch of other jobs. The situation that you're in now is bleaker than it was a few weeks ago. Now, whatever the situation, I'm sure all of us, or most of us at least, have experienced the disappointment of God not answering a prayer in the way that he had hoped or the way that we had expected. How do you respond in this situation? Do you respond like the Israelites do here and in anger at God, give up praying? Or worse still, blaming him because, of course, God is sovereign, so therefore he's choosing to put me through this misery. Is this the perspective that you find yourself taking? And to be really clear, this is the wrong response. God's promises to us may be fulfilled more slowly than we want, but they will be fulfilled. And his timing is always perfect. Now, because we know with hindsight that God used Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, we know that this rejection from Pharaoh was not a defeat. It was the platform for a victory that would bring God the most glory. 
In the same way, Jesus' death on the cross was not a defeat. It was the platform for a victory that would bring God the most glory. And in his resurrection, we receive assurance that Jesus has defeated sin and death. Just as he promised to free the Israelites and bring them into the promised land, this is his promise to us. That on the cross he has defeated sin and death. We are living in victory. So if we are found in him, and if our situation looks bleak right now, we can trust that in his perfect timing, he will fulfill his promises to us in a way that brings most glory to him. Okay, let's look at verses 22 and 23 of chapter 5. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. So here we see Moses himself now is upset at how things have panned out. It feels as though his newfound confidence that we, we read about only a few verses earlier is, is starting to slip away, and unbelief is taking its place. Have you ever experienced this? You're sure that God has called you to something. Maybe, maybe for some of us, you may have felt, I'm, I'm sure that God is calling me to, to be in Abu Dhabi, and that's why you're here today. But it's just not panned out in the way that you'd expected. And you start to doubt, did I, did I not hear God right? Or, or, or is he somehow punishing me in some way? Or, or is this just his plan for me that I'm going to live out the rest of my days unhappy? Does God even care? And Moses in this situation was certainly not right to doubt because by his very character, God will always, as we've looked at, he will always deliver on his promises. So to not believe him at his word is sin. So Moses wasn't right to be doubting God. But I think his actions in what he did with his unbelief was correct. He didn't take his doubts and hide them. He didn't pretend everything was okay. And he didn't turn away from God and try to free Israel from Pharaoh in his own power, as must have been tempting to try. But instead, he was honest with God. And he went to him and he said, Lord, you said this would happen. But it hasn't. Not in the way I expected anyway. Why? So in chapter 6, we see God's response. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give, you, give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So here, in response to Israel's unbelief, in response to Moses' doubts, we see God providing reassurance to his people. God reassures Moses that he is the God Almighty, more powerful than any other. God reassures Moses that he has made a covenant with the people of Israel. God reassures Moses 
that he will give them the land of Canaan. God reassures Moses that he has heard their cry and he remembers his covenant. God reassures Moses that he will deliver them. God reassures Moses that he will take them to be his own people. So what we need to ask ourselves is, were these things ever at risk? Would anyone like to hazard a guess? Were these things ever at risk? Okay. (laughs) Anyone else? (laughs) So my answer is no. (laughs) These things weren't at risk. God had already set out to fulfill his covenant with his people, to give them the land of Canaan, to hear their cries, to deliver them, to take them as his own. This was never in doubt. His sovereignty means that all these things come under his dominion, and he is faithful. He always does what he says he will do. Israel's circumstances, your circumstances, are inconsequential to God's ability to fulfill his promises. But don't get me wrong, he cares for us deeply. He is not aloof or distant to our suffering. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. So no matter what the situation you find yourself in, he can be fully trusted. Like Israel, our greatest problem always comes when we don't believe this. Because their biggest problem wasn't Pharaoh. Their biggest problem wasn't that they were in slavery. Their biggest problem wasn't that they didn't have enough straw to make bricks. Their biggest problem was that they didn't believe God at his word. Likewise, we should not be putting our security in our health or our wealth or our prosperity. These things, whilst important in the moment, are of limited eternal value. Our hope, our trust should be set firmly in God. He has proved perfectly trustworthy in keeping his covenant with the people of Israel. How much more then can we trust the covenant sealed by the blood of the perfect sacrifice, God himself in Jesus? Grace Church, if we are found in him, then we are safe and secure for all eternity. We can trust him in any situation. We can cast our burdens onto him, knowing that he will deliver us. I'm just going to close by reading what Jesus himself said in Matthew 6, verses 31 to 33. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So whatever it is you're facing today, seek him above all other things and throw yourself on his incredible grace, knowing and trusting that he will deliver you from all afflictions into an eternity of glory with him. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have made a covenant with us by your blood. We can trust you, Lord, even if it feels as though we are facing a Pharaoh that is bigger than we are able to cope with. We know that you are bigger, that your covenant with us is greater, and you will see it through to completion. I pray, Lord, for anyone here this morning who is facing such a situation. I pray, Lord, that you would bring comfort, that you would still their hearts, Lord, that they would know peace from you by the power of your Holy Spirit. We are so grateful, Lord Jesus, for the great hope we have in you, the sure and certain to seek you at times of trouble and to know in our hearts that you are good and trustworthy, and you will deliver us from all evil. In your precious name, amen.
Please join me in standing as we worship. Perfect in love, you are 
our service there Um, but yeah if I could just encourage you if this morning you are feeling weighed down uh, and struggling to trust in the promises that God makes to us then unfortunately we can't pray for each other here and now but seek somebody out that you know and they can pray for you another time or maybe outside or somewhere over zoom I'm sure we'll find a way Um, do not uh, kind of leave without without seeking God in this God is trustworthy, and he cares for us. So, like I said, we're going to close the service there. Just before we do that, I'd like to remind you we have a church out to lunch today. So if you are available, we're going to be going to Mushrif Mall Food Court, um, and it's just a great opportunity maybe to pray for each other, uh, to eat together, spend time together in fellowship. So if you're available straight after the service, please join us at Mushrif Mall Food Court. So I'll just close by reading a benediction over us from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse, it's a very small Bible, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God bless you, Grace Church.